Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach Podcast. I'm Ashton Doctor, your Habit Coach. And today we have a very special guest on the show. We're going to be talking about something that I feel is extremely important. It is something that we as a society are slowly, slowly shying away from. But I think it's important for us to embrace. And that is struggle. It's important to embrace the struggle doing the hard things. So today with us, we have a fantastic guest who's going to talk about this, Joel Green. Joel, welcome to the Habit Coach Podcast. So much for having me on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Joel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. I'm a Philadelphia native. There the majority of my life. I'm over in New Jersey now, but was able to just come up and, you know, during some pretty rough times, you know, in the, the middle of the crack era, the late 80s, early 90s, which was a difficult time. The environment I grew up in was, again, it was challenging. I'll say that. Mentally challenging, physically challenging at times, you know, pretty violent atmosphere I grew up in. I grew up in an abandoned house. You know, the house next door to us was also abandoned. That was burnt down, but a homeless guy lived there my entire time that we lived there during my childhood. And I witnessed, you know, violence. I was 10 feet away from a shooting at age of six and had escaped that, afraid of being shot because I was the only person there outside the other kid that was shot. Witnessing different things, it helped me develop a callus to difficulties and challenges early in life. And just, I learned how to even distract myself, (laughs) you know, to be honest, take my mind off of different negativity early in life and just begin developing different habits, just distraction, which ended up leading me towards success. Just trying to escape different moments. Basketball became that escape, to be honest, that distraction. And it took me pretty far. It's still taking me places, you know, although I retired from being a professional basketball player, it's still taking me far in business. I'm now CEO of a company. I'm a national director for Nike sports camps. And, you know, wow. more importantly, I'm a father. So that's, that's, that's my life in a nutshell. But That's the biggest win right there, right? Yeah. Joel, the question came to me, like when you were talking about the environment that you grew up in, right? How do you actually pull yourself out of something like that? Because it either makes you or breaks you, right? It's it's one of these two things. You never yeah, just right. come out unscathed from something like this. I dare say I, I didn't pull myself out. It, it was a collective effort. And okay. it, it came by way of, you know, my parents instilling faith in me and saying, look, we're going to get out of this. We're going to, we're going to. I would hear things like that often. Like, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're going to be able to do X, Y, Z. Hey, can we go to Disney World? No, not right now, but we're going to one day. I would ask to go to Disney World, man, every day. I used to, you know, get these VHS tapes, you know, and watch one of the VCR about Disney World. And I would watch them for years and I was never able to go until I think I was 20 years old. But I was asking since I was about six and I just understood. We didn't have the money to do it. But my parents always let us know one day, one day we'll be able to do this. We'll be able to do that. We used to wear donated clothes from the church and hey, it's all right. It, it was, I had, we, had, we had faith. You know what I mean? It was, I was the youngest of four in the household of six. And again, it was a collective effort just making me aware of, of a vision ahead of me. Like, hey, stay focused, continue to work toward that. You know, continue to do well in the classroom, do well on the court in your activities. And it's going to take you somewhere. You know, Joel, what you said is so critical, right? Is this word called hope, which is what, I think your parents were putting in, you know, they were saying that there is hope. There is hope. Don't give up. Exactly. Most of us lose that sense of hope when we're passing through a phase like this. Right. And the struggle that exists. When you work with people, when you talk about this, how do you get people to identify that hope? Because it's very difficult to find it. I mean, the first thing they have to be aware of, honestly, is, is having awareness to know that today doesn't have to be tomorrow. You're not going to be mm-hmm. where you are right now forever. And you just can't be so caught up and lost in the emotions of where you are. That's really what clouds our moments. It's the emotions of where we are. All of a sudden, we're not able to fully judge and perceive that moment properly because it was so emotional in that moment to where I know it's not always the easiest thing to do to remove emotions from our moments, but it has to happen in order for us to clearly see what's taking place, what's transpiring. And that's where I tell people all the time, look, just take a moment, breathe, you know, breathe and just really ask yourself, why is what's taking place taking place? But without emotion, don't say, why is this happening to me? Sit back for a moment, say, "Okay, I wonder why this is actually taking place. That same it's the same question, but it's asked in a different way. And when you are able to remove some emotion from your questions about life, you're able to actually get some clearer answers. That's what I had to begin to do for myself was to remove the emotions and say, okay, how can I break this down? How can I filter these moments to actually draw something out 
And even beyond that, I had to ask myself, what can I draw out to actually propel me to the other side? What can I use from the darkness, from the dark moments to actually turn into motivation to propel me beyond this moment that I'm going through? Wow. Joel, there's so much to unpack in what you just said. The first thing is, if you just say, why is this happening with emotion, it becomes why me. And when you right. remove the emotion, it becomes an objective look at what's happening in your life, I think. So getting that objectivity is critical and then using what you've just learned as rocket propellant almost to take mm -hmm. you to that next level. How did you identify that aspect that took you to the next level, that learning that you got from it? I, I learned that from sports, to be honest, to where if I was challenged in the world of sports on the basketball court or running track, then... I took that challenge. Head on, said, okay. I see that you you got the best of me here. Now it's my turn to learn how to level up. It's my turn to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, let's do some self-assessment. Here's where I lacked, but here's where I'm going to grow at the same time. And so when it came down to just other sides of life, I used the same thing to where I may have experienced a dark moment, a disappointment to where it's like, okay, that got me here. But here's also an area where I can grow. So let me actually use this dark moment against itself to win against that potentially the next time it, it tries to rear its ugly head. And so, you know, I had a moment to where as a teenager, I tragically lost one of my older brothers. And that was the toughest thing, still one of the toughest things I've ever had to experience. And I said, okay, how can I use this? I had to lean into it. I couldn't run away from it. The moment I leaned into it, I got motivation from it. I started making promises to my brother, like, okay, I'm going to do the things you've been trying to teach me to do this whole time. You've been telling me, hey, get better grades. You've been telling me, go harder on the court so that you can get that scholarship to college. And I began doing that. I began making that promise to him, making those promises to him and finding motivation, even through his death, which was, it was, it was a difficult thing to do, but it drove me to, to say, I'm still here. You know, I'm still here. I'm able to live. I'm going to live this thing to the fullest at this point because I tomorrow, tonight isn't promised. So now I'm going to live it up because I see life can be taken. So I was able to find some motivation even by way of death. The darkest of moments, I just began applying that mentality and that filtering process, you know, to, to everything. I say, how can I break this thing down to actually take something from it and, and drive me forward? And it's an amazing thing, uh, amazing tool I've been using and, and thank God it's been working. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Using that as motivation. You also mentioned that you, you, you had distractions that, that helped you through these times. Yeah. What kind of distractions? You just creative outlets, you know, drawing, art, you know, artwork. I used to want to be an architect when I was growing up uh, as a child and I used to just make model homes and uh, all the time. So again, being in the not, <laughs> not the most ideal house. Our parents, they used to drive us across the bridge, you know, to New Jersey, right? They would take us to these big, beautiful homes, these model homes, these brand new houses that were being made and, and being built. And we would, you know, after church, we would go get, you know, a treat and we would drive across the bridge and just, and just drive around this area. And sometimes we would go out and go inside and tour and take a tour of these new houses. And me and my sister asked my parents some years ago, like, why did they used to do that? They said we were planting seeds. We wanted you guys to know, honestly, what the other side looked like. We wanted you to know what, what existed beyond where we lived every single day. And it planted the seed so perfectly, man. Um, it, it was amazing. It was, a, again, it was a great distraction. Even that from where we were, how impoverished we were. Beyond that, I had other distractions. Again, artwork, basketball was just the most amazing distraction because it took me out of my neighborhood, which is what I needed. It took me out of that physical environment. And it put me around other people, other cultures, which was like the best thing ever because I didn't know how to relate to others that didn't look like me, that didn't sound like me, that didn't live where I lived. But it, it gave me great exposure and it was the ultimate distraction. Joel, you have some rock star parents, okay? They, they give you hope. <laughs> they planted these seeds. Yeah. Fantastic, right? Like, I think yeah. there's so much that, that, that listeners can take away just from parenting advice from, from this, <laughs> yeah. this episode, just picking up those elements. But Joel, Embracing the struggle, right? When I say that, what are the thoughts that come to your mind? Embracing the struggle just means it's acceptance. That's one thing that I feel we struggle with so often is the acceptance of reality. Of what oh, that's a big one. Place. Yeah. Oh, that's a big one. 
the realities that we refuse to accept are the struggle, the tougher ones. We accept the happy reality. We accept winning. We accept getting paid. We accept all, you know, we accept those moments happily, but we, re- we fight against the moments that aren't ideal. And it's like, we have to accept those just as much and just as well. And when we do, we fight less against life. I think that we were put here not to make the bad stuff good. I really believe that the bad stuff was put here to make us better, right? Like, I feel like the bad stuff was put here to refine us, but we don't accept the bad stuff. We always try to remove it or make it good. It's like, no, let's accept that and allow that stuff to work for us in our favor to actually make us amazing. And I think when we go about it with that perspective, we then even view those bad things, those difficult moments as not so bad. It's, it's, it's not about being optimistic. It's just really about viewing those things beneath their surfaces to realize there's something that lies beneath that can actually work for us. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Welcome back. All right, let's jump into the conversation. This is so powerful. Just accepting that this exists is going to give you that little boost that you need in order to get over it. Joel, I'm going to flip it on its head. Okay. There are lots of people who go through zero struggle, right? They, They have all the money. They have all of these things that are there and they're still unhappy with it. What should those people do? Should they be looking out for struggles? What should they be doing? How do they become stronger? How do they evolve? What can help them is just understanding of the other side so they can have some empathy, right? And I think with the empathy will come even further understanding and that will allow them to at least see what struggle looks like, you know, feels like. Again, with empathy, that's a feeling. I think what they need to know is the feeling of the other side. Now, not to say that they have to go ahead and and lose all their money on purpose or lose their opportunities on purpose. No, you don't want to do that. But to lack an understanding of the other side is ignorance. And you don't want to have that because even that ignorance can lead to failure at some point because you just weren't aware of certain things. And, you know, for them, again, I I wouldn't say put themselves, honestly, yes, they should seek those moments of discomfort, seek those moments of, you know, imperfection, of failure. You know, I'm I'm big on seeking failure. I'll be honest with you. Uh, That's something I do on purpose. I have no problem. What does that mean? How do you do that? For me, I go all in with my desire, right? So I make sure I do it tactfully with strategy, but I don't mind mishaps. I don't mind hiccups. I don't mind failure points. That's that's just a part of the process for me. So I've come to realize failure is just literally, it's a midpoint. It's not an end point for me. If it happens, it's literally it's just a detour. Okay, let me figure out another way, make an adjustment. It's not a dead end though. I'm going to keep moving. And so I literally seek moments of failure. That always shows me I must be giving my best with this thing. And I, I tell that to athletes that I work with. If I'm taking you through a drill or an exercise and I'm expecting you to go full speed and you're perfectly executing this thing from the start, you're probably not going your absolute highest rate of intensity and speed because when you do that, mistakes happen. But Also, when you do that, you're taking yourself to your highest ability level and mistakes has to happen when you're taking yourself to your highest ability level. When we stay in safe mode, you can stay in safe mode and not make any mistakes at all, but you're not actually growing. So, you know, if somebody already has it all and they already, you know, doing well, they're doing well, but they may not be going the absolute hardest even with different things. If they're not making mistakes, you know. They're not doing their absolute best. They just, they're talented, of course, but it may not be reaching their highest level. They've left stuff on the table that, yeah. that you have to get through that struggle. You have to. Right. Fantastic. Um, Joel, a question on when you came out of that lifestyle, right? When you were mm-hmm. breaking out of that struggle and now you have found success, you have a fantastic house, mm-hmm. you have a fantastic family, all those things. Does it ever, does imposter syndrome ever sneak in? It tries to, but I'm big on not being complacent. I don't mind discomfort. Again, I, I seek failure. So I may, I put myself in a situation of, okay, you know what? I can delegate this objective to somebody else, but nope, I'm going to do it. Mm. I'm going to still do it because although it may be grueling, 
And I just, I'll be honest, I don't like doing this or that part, updating a certain part of a website. I make sure I do it to keep myself humble. I'm being honest with you. You know, it keeps me in a, a place of humility and of grind and grit. It keeps that grit in me, which is what got me where I am. And so I don't want to completely remove certain objectives that I may not enjoy doing. Some things I will pass off to my intern. Some things I actually have kept for myself on purpose just to make sure I'm checking myself on a regular basis. Like, nope, you keep doing this because this keeps you in that creative space of not having it all. Even if you have a lot, I enjoy feeling like I don't have much. I enjoy being in a place of desperation many times because I work that much harder. So, uh, you know, I, I put myself there on purpose. Fantastic. Joel, you've written an amazing book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Oh, sure, sure. It's uh, called Filtering, The Way to Extract Strength from the Struggle. And again, that's that's what I do with, with life. I, I filter it. I break it all down. And it's, it's a tool and a method that I developed about eight years ago and just had, I practiced it. I spoke it from the stage and I saw how it affected people from the stage. I said, okay, I have to put it in print. And it's just really about, again, leaning into your circumstances to find out why those things are here. Because so often when difficulty happens, we're so quick just to remove them from our lives because they're painful. They hurt. We don't want them around. But we negate finding out why those things came. And what tends to happen is those things come right back around again, maybe with a different face on them because we didn't learn the lessons initially. So by way of filtering, you know, you're able to break your situation down while it's happen- happening and you don't have to just go through things and wait on hindsight years later to reveal the answers. You can actually develop foresight in the moment and say, OK, I, I got it. This is why it happened. And now I can see it coming down the pipe the next time it may try to arise. Like in the book, it's been helping people in an amazing way. Again, we released it two weeks ago. And uh, I'm just excited that it's making the impact that I desired for it to make. And uh, so many people are just like, wow, this is already, you know, mind changing and life changing. It, it feels good to hear. Who is this book for? What kind of person? What what would they be going through in life would immediately connect with something like this? For those that are just looking to overcome, you know, I'll be honest with you that that could, you know, obviously that's I would love to niche it down and, and narrow it down even more. But honestly, I wrote this book to overcome myself so much that I was going through experiencing, you know, job loss and, you know, loss of loved ones and going through divorce and going through a whole lot of life, being a single father, going through all these things. I was seeking answers. I had to figure out a way to not just get through my stuff. I wanted to like literally grow while I was amidst those things and get to the other side and be amazing on the other side of it. And, you know, I've been able to figure that out. So I said, this is really for those who are looking to not only overcome, but to see life from a different vantage point or two or three, to carry a different perspective and not just be in their default emotional state all the time and just say, okay, wow, I didn't see life from this angle. I can be honestly become your own therapist in many aspects. And that's what I think will help us to get through different things is by just seeing things, as you mentioned earlier, objectively, you know, and not just our own narrow point of view. Fantastic. Joel, last question. What are your five top habits that you do every day? Five top habits. Well, number one, you know, this is probably a typical one that you may hear, but I wake up early. That's a habit of mine that, man, I've I've been practicing since sports, you know, so I I wake up early, you know, five o'clock now is early, but it used to be 4.30. Wow. And sometimes it's still, you know, 4.45. You know, I, I like that. For me, it's a small achievement to wake up at four or five. You know, I feel good about myself. Beat but, the alarm um, clock. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. It's a nice little achievement. And um, so that's, you know, right around five o'clock on average. So maybe before uh, a lot of times. But do that. I wake up for the first 20 minutes. I pray and just mm-hmm. give myself some some time of just like gratefulness, to be honest. Another way to keep myself in a place of humility and just in gratefulness. I'm, I'm big on gratitude. That's just Fantastic. Who I am. Um, so I, I pray for about 20 minutes. I eat, you know, uh, and that's, that's, that's a great habit of mine because I'm, I'm physically active. I'm an active person throughout the day. So wake up, I pray, I eat a small breakfast and then I work out right after that. And then, you know, 
So that's four things right there. The thing I do after that is I wake my son up. By this time, it's around seven o'clock. I wake him up. We work out and we go over quotes. And so those things, and then we eat a breakfast together. Like that's my second breakfast of the day, but now I eat a little bit larger breakfast because I'm, I'm hungrier for my workout and stuff like that. I have a nice routine that it helps me out to where I know I'm about to be active. So I, I feed myself, you know what I mean? And it feels good every morning to give and impart something into my son. It's nothing like it. It's so fulfilling for me. It just makes me feel great before 8 a.m. It's like, I, I, I love it. That's amazing routine right there. Joel, thank you so much for coming on the Habit Coach podcast and talking to us. Um, how can people get in touch with you, you know, connect with you, continue this conversation with you? Passion, I appreciate it again, man. Um, you know, you can see me. I'm on Instagram often nowadays. I love engagement. That's the thing with me. If people know, I, I will direct mis- message people that contact me and, and have a full conversation that way. If, if they have any questions from, me, you know, if I can help in any regard, you can reach me on there at Jay Green PLT, J A Y Green PLT. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn, the typical platforms, and uh, my website, JoelBGreen.com. But uh, I just, again, I love engagement. That's the thing with me. I, I feel like my purpose is just to to help others level up. And it feels great for me when I'm able to do that. How beautiful is that? Joel, thank you again for coming on. We put all the links in the show notes below so people can reach out to you. Fantastic. Now, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are at IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me, I am at Ashton Doc on Twitter and Instagram. We have a brand new habit coaching online course, quizzes, videos, and a lot more on the website awesome180.com. So check it out now. <laughs>